Hey, my name's James Mulvaney and welcome to Working Lunch, the show where I speak to a different expert every week to discuss three actionable strategies to grow your audience, grow your business or grow your team. Now, today's session is about to begin, so stay right there and we'll be kicking off today's session very shortly. All right, welcome to Working Lunch. Today, my guest is going to be Sam Sethi, founder of Podcast Festival Events. All right, Sam, how's it going? Welcome to Working Lunch. Thanks, James. How are you? Did you? Yeah, good. How's it going? Very well. I'm I'm sat in a radio studio, so apologies. I have more mics around me than I know what to do with, but I haven't got one into my laptop. I think the fact that you're in a sort of treated soundproof studio makes it sound all right. Okay, I'll get away with it. The worst is when someone's in a a big, you know, like a huge empty room with a laptop and it's just like, you know, the the reverb causes a kind of echo. Um, Okay, so start off then by just introducing yourself. Tell us about what you do and and, and also tell us why you're sat in a radio studio right now. (laughs) Okay. Um, I'm a radio presenter on Marlo FM my show syndicated around the UK, and I also am a podcaster. And so they're my two main gigs. Um, the radio presenting came about by chance, but now I've developed it into a business and technology show that I do every Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So straight after this, I'll be jumping onto a radio show, um, which is great fun. And, yeah, I love just podcasting as well. So they're my right. two main things. And and so if, just if someone wants to listen to you after this, how can they tune in? So if they want to listen to the radio show, they can ask their Alexa to play Marlow FM or they can go to the website marlowfm.co.uk and listen live. Yep. Or conversely, if they want to listen to any of my podcasts, you can go to sandtalks.technology and you'll find over 100 different podcasts with some really interesting people. There's some good interviews on there. Um, I'm you curious to know, I was even on there, but um, I was listening to the guy, I think it was when you interviewed me, the, the chat before me, it was the founder of... Um, uh, was it Friends Reunited, one of those kind yeah. of early dating sites? And he had yeah. a really interesting story, I thought. Yeah, he, he basically set it up by mistake. It was his yeah. wife's idea. And then the next thing you know, he sold it and made a fortune, got yeah. bored. He was still young, bought it back, a bit like Bebo did, like Michael Birch bought Bebo back. But unlike Michael Birch, he didn't sell it again for the second time. Uh, but, yeah, he's sort of kicking around, but he's just so happy. He's just investing mm. in companies on the side now. I think, you know, as well, it was one of those kind of early success stories from when you, you could kind of start something, you know, on a, a little bit. It's a bit bit trickier nowadays, I think, but um, certainly right place, right time, I think, definitely. And, and kind you're, of good a idea. Lot, you're a lot younger than I am. Yeah. And so my generation, it was the first social network. Mm. And all of us joined for only one reason, to find out if that girl we fancied in year seven, yeah. what she was doing now. And so many affairs started on Friends Reunited. It was ridiculous. Didn't it have a curse? Wasn't it like the curse of Friends Reunited yeah, or something? Absolutely. Or just, yeah. Um, and so how did you get firstly involved in, in radio? What's, what was sort of sparked your interest of in broadcasting? A friend of mine on the radio station said, you fancy doing an 80s show? And I'd never mm. done radio. I'd done DJing before. And I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the first person to say, look, try things that are new. Always change, always always play with something different. Yep. So I got into it, and after I'd played Shalimar for about the 10th time, I really was bored. I mean, right. the 80s is a great era, but then I did the 90s and whatever. But you get bored after a while, and I sound like Alan Partridge after about 10 minutes doing music radio. It's uh-huh. not my genre. But I always wanted to do a business and technology show. There are so many brilliant entrepreneurs, both here in the UK, Europe, and obviously across the pond. And, and they've all got a great story. So I just wanted to tell that story. Of, and that's where the business and te- technology show started. And um, before we sort of get into to the, to today's discussion, the last sort of question I want to ask you is, what do you think it is about radio that people love? And why is it sort of still prominent as ever? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the big debate right now is podcasting versus radio. Mm. Uh, radio has to be live and interactive. If you're not live and interactive, then you might as well do a podcast because mm-hmm. – being live, it's really funny. Being live with you right now, it, it gives you that extra adrenaline rush. You, you're on yeah. the end. You know, we can't do a take two. We can't do whatever. But on a podcast, it's like, oh, stop. I'll edit that later. I'll do something with it. So live radio gives you that real lovely adrenaline rush. And I, I wouldn't miss it for the world. 
and I think that's that's what what, what why it speaks to so many people, you know, quite literally. Um, but you know, that's that's the excitement, isn't it? It's that you know you've got somewhere who's someone who sat there on the other end of the line, and I think during lockdown, you know, that's um, was so important to lots of people. Yeah. You know, we we saw huge spikes in in listener levels across the board on on Radio Co, and you know, it's really interesting because I think your podcast listening kind of stayed around the same. It didn't really spike, but radio, my goodness, we saw a huge hike. Like it's just. I think it's because there's, there's that human connection. You've got someone, like you say, it's live. They're, they're, they're right there with you almost. Yeah. Cool. So let's dive into today's topic. We're going to be talking all about podcasting. Um, firstly, basically how to sort of formulate and produce a podcast, then how to promote it, and then talking about sort of how to start monetizing it and sponsorship yeah. and advertising. So let's kick things off. Okay. So what would you like me to start? How we, how I produce them? Yeah, yeah. let's talk about um, if someone's thinking about starting a podcast, what are your recommendations for, for starting out? Find a passion. Find your yeah. passion. First. Don't, don't do a podcast just because everyone else is doing a podcast because everyone else is doing a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's, what, over a million podcasts out there now. So you are going to be the million and one. And if you're going to just do it because you feel you have to, you'll get bored by episode seven or even sooner. Um, I think most people think podcasting is just stick a mic, have a little chat, and, you know, the world will knock on your door, and it doesn't work that way. Um, more often than not, you'll find that you end up talking to nobody in the first several podcasts, and you have to get your mates to start talking about it. And yeah. it's hard, and, and we'll come on to it, but editing also, I spend more time editing and distributing and promoting my podcast than I do recording it, uh, and people don't when they first start out understand that that's where you spend your time Mm. do you think that's a good formula then to think about you know is there sort of like a sort of a set proportion of how much time you think someone should spend promoting versus editing versus actually recording three to one is my ratio I, i i spend a lot of time editing because when i have guests it's really weird you i've learned to pick up people's social tics most people don't realize they've got a voice voice tick, you know, um, uh, right. You know, he said, got it like, like, you know, yeah. it's awful on a podcast when you listen back to it, but people don't realize that they've got that social tick. Um, and when you edit back, you, you have to cut those out. You have to cut out the big gaps between. And most people, when they're talking, it's not that they mean to do, um, or, uh, it's their brain because it's live that go, um, what shall I say next? What's the next thing I've got to say? Mm. Uh, and that, that to me really is where I think uh, I spend most of my time. So I'm on th- here. Do you think it's, it's worth people spending time editing that out then? I do. Because there's different trains of thought on that. Some people say it doesn't matter. It sounds more conversational. It's, you know, if someone's excessively nervous and they're <coughs> hesitating all the time and you do sometimes speak to people like that who, you know, if it's the first time, doing and i just said you know then <laughs> you know like, which is one of those things you know it's, it's the first time recording a podcast and they're really not sure what to say and yes they might sort of hesitate or they might kind of go oh can i start that bit again or, or whatever but is that really necessary to fair enough you need to take those real kind of hiccups out but every single lumber nerd you think the inter- you should spend time taking it out because that's a lot of time investment isn't it, it takes a long time to get that right i think if you're using older tools like audacity um y- yeah i wouldn't do it but mm. we'll come on to, on to something like Descript, which just makes it a one click to remove. Mm. So that's why I do it. For example, a lot of people do the there's or double words in their conversation. I never realized people did it, but they, they go the, 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 the point of the, 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 mm. and it's like, and when you listen back to an edited podcast and it's clean, cleaned up, the person sounds more intelligent. I don't mean you sound unintelligent because you do it, but it just, I've got permission from you and I only have permission from you to be in your ears because I'm going to deliver a podcast that gives you value. If I'm wasting your time with a puffed out podcast that is fat and bloaty, as I I think, I think it's disrespectful. You've given me permission. Let me make it the best experience I can for you. Keep it concise. And, and also when you're talking about editing, how often how long do you record for and, and and do you try and have a sort of set time limit that you you stick to or no i mean I, 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 everyone i've listened to your show as well and there's many other experts better than me who've said you know 25 minutes it's the the commute to work it's the dog walk it's whatever i go with the theory that it's it's only as good as it's interesting so okay if it's 25 minutes great 
that's 25 minutes. I interviewed Charles Cadbury the other day. We were talking about his new Alexa skill. That was a 25 minute podcast. It was brilliant. Didn't need to waffle. That was tight. I listened to somebody else the other day I was recording and that went on for an hour, hour 15, actually. Uh, yeah. And it was all good stuff still. So no, it's I don't have a length. Right. Okay. And so, and, but then do you try and, did you try and sort of always reduce the amount of time uh, someone speaks for and just try and take out the juicy bits then? Is that your kind of approach to editing? Yeah. I mean, I will always try and make the guest feel comfortable. So, you know, if it was you on my show, I'd say, hey, James, uh, you know, where are you in the world today? How's yes. COVID? You're getting comfortable with me and I'm getting comfortable with you. But mm. my listener doesn't need to know that part of the no. conversation. Yeah. So I'll edit that out. Uh, again, the person might start talking about something that isn't related to the topic that we're on, but it's fun for me and him to talk about or she. Um, but that isn't something I'd leave in. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about sort of when you when you sort of open uh, a recording up with a guest, do you normally press that record button the second that you get on? Because you mentioned, yes, OK, you'll edit out the, the sort of the niceties, the introduction. Sometimes people say that some of the conversation on the priest show chat sometimes can end up being more interesting than stuff that you talk about during the show and i've had this myself either where i've been on the guest side of the seat where i've sort of started telling someone a story and thought actually this is probably quite good for the for the actual recording itself and they've not been recording so i'll then think right let's get that in or or also on the, the interviewer side where i've been sat there interviewing someone and actually some of the stuff that the person says before you hit the record button can be more revealing and more interesting than the kind of, I suppose a lot of people have a kind of a, a set list of things that they want to discuss or the kind of their, their spiel that they talk about time and time again, so to speak. Um, so, so what do you think about that? I don't do that. Yeah. I, partly because I think it's a little unfair on the guest because <laughs> um, it, I, I like to say, right, we are now recording. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's because of being a blogger and a journalist before. I like to have a private moment where they can say anything they like. So mm. I've had people reveal, I had a, a famous Sky TV presenter who revealed to me that she was now a lesbian. Yeah. Didn't even ask her the question, but she decided that she'd reveal that to me. Mm. And I was like, damn, I wish she could say that in the podcast. But actually, she didn't want to. Yeah, and that's fair enough. Fine. Yeah. You know. So you think sort of start, start off you know in, if you're sort of templating this you know have a have a five minute chat with someone mm -hmm. then like, be clear about when you're hitting that record button and and off you go and then sort of to get on to you mentioned Descript before i'm kind of keen to talk about this because i think this is a really interesting tool we've been using it a little bit for some client work um for people who are watching who aren't aware what is Descript and, and how has it helped you with your editing so Descript's a podcasting studio. Uh, mm. You can, I record most of my interviews over Zoom because of COVID currently, but you can record directly into Descript. But the power of Descript is it uses uh, the ability to auto transcribe the whole podcast. And then mm. like a Word document, I can just cross out bits. I can cut and paste bits. I can remove, as I said, all the ums, the ahs, the likes, you knows, the double words in one click. So they all go. Normally, I find it's like a hundred plus double words or whatever. Mm. I've tightened that up and it's not taking me time. But what's really amazing is as I edit the transcription, it's automatically editing the audio for me at the same time. Yes. So I'm not guessing in the wave file where, where did James say that word or how do I get that? And what's really nice is then also because of the transcription being labeled, it, it automatically detects the speakers as well. I can cut out a clip. So you might have said something really amazing. I can cut that clip out, put it to the side, and then that becomes my audiogram to promote that podcast later. And So it's really powerful in its ability to allow me to edit the podcast visually, um, mm. like I would a doc Word document. And then when I publish or export it, the normalization that it does is unbelievably good. I once decided, I can't remember why, so I used to spend hours in Audacity or in Adobe Audition, you know, mm. getting the, the, the normalization, the sound levels right. And it was, you know, I'd never get it right. I wasn't good enough. You know, I wasn't a, an engineer, studio engineer. So I was lucky. I, I was, I was, as I said, I, I call it editing in the dark. I was just guessing where it was. Mm -hmm. And Descript, actually, I, I uploaded a edited version of Descript back into Audacity and the align was perfect for both volume tracks. It was just perfect. And I knew the levels were right. So it just simplifies my life. Um, and I'm a real advocate of Descript as a product. I think uh, the other thing I'd say is that the CEO of Descript is Andrew Mason. He's the ex-CEO of Groupon. 
Okay, I didn't know that actually. Yeah, and yeah, the other thing is the company that you invested into them. You, you often think who invested is mm. Andreessen Horowitz, and you know that they never go for a donkey. Mm, absolutely, they did a really interesting article on the sort of podcasting space, didn't they? As well, I think last yes. year or the year before. So, you know, I think one of the good things about Descript as well is it's it's a great example of how AI is kind of powering like transcription is really good on eScript, but also that you can actually um, correct your own voice. So you, you can kind of start sort of filling in the blanks if you miss a word out or if you want to correct a sentence. It actually uses AI to create like a computer-generated version of your voice, which is, to me, is like remarkable. Yeah, it's called Overdub. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's called Overdub. And I was on the beta and I I'd spent half an hour training my voice. And then I recorded something and I asked my wife to come in and tell me what was the real me and what was the overdub she got it bloody wrong i couldn't believe it she got wow. me 26 years we've been together and she couldn't tell my voice from the computer i don't know what that says do you use that feature much sadly i don't i mean I, no. i've i've tried i mean I, I i think it's one of those amazing magic moments when you see it happen and then i try and work out when i'm going to use it and i haven't yet really had a real I, i've started to wonder whether i do jingles with it because they've added a whole load of computer generated professional voices to overdub so now what you can do mm. is you can type out your jingle and then choose one of the computer generated voices that doesn't sound computer generated and you can make your jingle and you put your music bed in and suddenly you've got your own jingle within about 10 minutes so you could use that for sort of introducing yourself or introducing a guest there's lots yeah. of creative ways you could you could use that yeah. um I wonder how it copes with like complicated names and things because this is the thing with these these AI voices they don't always get it right even when you're on Google Maps you know navigating around it occasionally throws in a street name and you're like what <laughs> or, or uh, you know just the way it pronounces certain roads and things it just it, you know so I think the thing is that the, the, the AI voices are kind of my opinion on them anyway is like they they're, they're good they're much better than they were like 10 15 years ago mm. still not quite there yet though no and I'd say with Descript you probably are- 95 96 percent accurate um it doesn't recognize quite a few odd things so if you've got a company name it probably won't recognize it properly um and you can go and then the nice thing about it is you can literally like a word document go back and just type over the mm. transcription and it'll just you know it won't destroy the the audio and it's brilliant in that sense okay cool um so next up is let's just talk about distributing and kind of marketing a podcast. This is a question that's you know on loads of people's minds, and, and certainly when you first start out, it's intimidating. It's like, how do I get listeners? How do I actually get people tuning in and, and listening to what I have to say? Because especially now, there's so much competition. Everyone's starting podcasts, as you mentioned before. You know, I think to, to begin with, the, the first thing you know we always advise clients to do. And I always talk about is just like making sure you've actually got quality products, making sure it's something that's interesting for people to listen to um, or, or, ed, or entertaining, whatever angle you're going off. But how do you then go and, and kind of get it to, out to the masses? So, as I said, I spend more time distributing and promoting my podcast mm. than I do probably creating and editing. And that's because there's no point doing it if no one's listening to it. You know, you might as well stop there and then. Mm -hmm. uh, I started off using a product called Headliner. And Headliner is a great little app. Uh, I'd upload my MP3 from Descript. I'd add a little, like an album cover to it, in effect, a little image up front. I'd, I'd put some moving uh, animation voice thing that over it. And why was that? Because we're all meerkats. We all... We're all going through our streams and, you know, the minute there's a GIF or, or there's an animated just sound wave, oh, what was that? Let me yeah. stop and have a look. And that's the sole reason I do it. There is no value other than it's a moving object. But what that allowed me to do was to create uh, a two-minute. So most people know, and if they don't, let me just explain. So you've got uh, unlimited upload into Facebook. So if I wanted to take an hour's podcast and throw it into Facebook, I could. I don't, but I could. I've got 10 minutes roughly on LinkedIn for my podcast and I've got two minutes, 20 seconds on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And that's all you can upload. So I make sure I take those clips from Descript at two minutes sections and I go, right, James has said something really clever there. Put that aside, cut and paste that part, cut and paste that part. And then I upload those as audiograms into social media. Now that's how I used to do it. And that was, step one to me learning how to distribute and try and gain an audience 
but I found a product that I really love, a bit like I love yep. eScript, and it's called Lately.ai, and it's an amazing, amazing product. Okay, and what does Lately do then? What's How's it different to creating audiograms or...? So very much similar to what you said, AI is becoming much more helpful. You know, yeah. You know, it's gone off the oh, it sounds glossy when you say AI to actually doing something useful. So what lately does, uh, it takes your video, podcast, or blog, and it allows you to put it into their system. And then what it does, it creates twenty or thirty tweetable, audioable videoable if that's even a bloody word um <laughs> uh, and and allows it, it creates those 30 things so it transcribes your uh, podcast for example let's stick with podcasting mm -hmm. allows you to then see those 30 and the ai and the algorithm is working out what it thinks is interesting within the podcast now how it does that i i don't know that's a bit more black box but the results are really good right. and what it does is it takes those 30 and then a bit like hootsuite you can then well, first of all, before you, you do that part, you can then go back and manually edit if you really want to. But what it's done is it's taken the words and attached the audio to it. And then you can literally hit that and tweet that out. But what's nice about it, it also adds a calendar function. So now I can set a, in a day, I can say, right, do every two hours, send out one of these 30 tweets. And right. I can then say, send it out to Twitter LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, wherever I want it to go, any of my social media endpoints. Hmm. And so suddenly I've saved a bucket load of time yeah. from having to manually find that interesting bit within my podcast to letting the AI take out based on you know NLP results, search results, everything that they know. Hmm. And that's brilliant because now I've got something that I can use. Now, I don't have to send all the 30 out. I might choose only five of those. Do you find that some are really effective, you know, and some are actually not very good? You know, does it kind of not always get it right? Some are a bit kind of, you know, confusing or whatever. Yeah, uh, and that, that's fine. But that's the, the human element I can apply yeah. to the last part. And so th th what I think of lately is it's more about unlocking the value of my podcast. So, look, you asked me earlier, how long's a podcast? And I, mm. you know, how long's a piece of string? 25 minutes to an hour and a half. An hour and a half podcast, maybe people aren't going to listen to it all. So I need to find a way of finding those chunks of gold that are in the podcast that you've talked about mm -hmm. so that somebody might, oh, look, you know, we might start off with talking about radio.co and then we talked about podcast.co. Then you told me about your Manchester, you know, previous radio show that you did. And then you tell me something else you're doing. And suddenly, you know, but all of that might not be applicable to the listener, but they might love to know more about Matchmaker. So mm -hmm. that tweet that goes out about Matchmaker would be the one that drags them back to listen to that podcast. And I only want to come to that section. So how can I do that? When Lately really helps me do that. Great. Um, and it, the web address is, is lately.ai, isn't it? It is, yes. Um, just quickly before we kind of move on to the next topic, if anyone has any questions for Sam or myself, please put them in the comments. We'll happily take some bit of Q&A at the end. Um, I've seen we've, got, we've already got a few in, which is great. So, um, yeah, we'll be coming on to those in a bit. But if anyone's got any questions based on what we've talked about or anything really to do with podcasting or radio, um, you know, it'd be, be great to sort of have a little bit of a, an open discussion at the end. Okay, so lately, um, you know, it, it, it's obviously a massive time saver. I think the, the real value of that tool is the fact that you've got, you know, you, you've not only got the um, – sort of AI sort of generation of these assets built in, but it's like you say, social media management side, because normally to do this, you could either do it yourself using a tool like Headline, or you could hire a videographer to, to create these assets for your sort of social marketing manager, but then you've actually got to schedule those stuff. So there's kind of a clear time saving, the fact that you kind of immediately just put in these assets into one platform. Um, you're not having to sort of download them, export them, re-import them, all this kind of thing, because it does take a lot of time. It's easy to miss things as well, I think. Yeah, and at the end of the day, what what's nice about it is you can also measure because it's got great analytics. What which ones worked? When did it work? What right. Was, what time was the best tweet that went out? So then you can tweak when you send yours out again. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're not just, I guess, shooting in the dark, which is what I think you do when we manually edit podcasts and try and clip bits that we think are interesting. We're not really getting any measurable value back. We're just hoping. Uh, we're hoping that we hit the right tweet at the right time for the right people mm -hmm. with, with lately. what I find is that you actually get a, a tangible record of what worked and what didn't. And then you can just tweak your, your own personal output. 
Okay, great. Um, and then, so sort of moving on to the final topic, which is monetization. And this mm-hmm. is something, again, I think a lot of people will think, I want to start a podcast because it's a, an easy way of making money or because I'm going to become rich. Or well, they see Joe Rogan, you know, interviewing huge celebrities and think, you know, it's going to blow up overnight. You know, of course, th- there's a lot more to it than, than that. Um, what's your advice in terms of how to actually start make, turn, turning a podcast into a business? First and foremost, I think you have to do a volume of podcasts. You have to get the podcasting right. Mm-hmm. You have to build your audience. Um, it, it's like anything. A sponsor or an advertiser will only come to you if they think you've got a credible audience in a vertical that they want to be involved in. Right. So don't expect day one. Uh, you might be lucky. You might you know, know the, the chairman of a company who's got loads of spare cash and wants to throw it your way. But the reality is most likely people are going to say, no, show me your track record. Show me that this is going to be around for a while. Um, Mm. I don't like podcasts. um, And I'll mention one, for example, and and I love the podcast. Leah Laporte's Twitter, I think, is a great platform. If anyone's not listened to it, it's slightly high level in terms of, you know, it doesn't go deep on anything, but it just covers the general tech news. But I don't get the idea of putting Casper mattresses as an advert or <laughs> talking about selling Chipotle whatever's. Like, yeah. that's such a run. You know I'm going to fast forward through it as on a podcast. The advertisers should know that. There's probably very little measurement between the, the audience and the advertiser. Mm. Um, I actually prefer, and I have done, is, is to get sponsors for my podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, to me, is a much more credible things so at the beginning of my podcast i'll say this podcast is brought to you by x y or z yes and then i've got a clean podcast and then at the end i can thank the sponsor again and then have a call to action for them and that means i'm not in the middle of the podcast going oh sorry james time for an advert i've got Mm. to tell you something about it um so So, a lot of sorry james go on so so it's a bit just to say clarify there so it's really about making sure not only you're, you're reaching out to companies who might be of interest to to your audience but you know that they're actually actively willing to then sort of you know spend some money promoting themselves on your podcast but it's just about finding that match it's about knowing your audience and having you know been really clued up on exactly who's listening to your show in the first place that's the kind of the first starting point i think yeah i mean you you know you've got to look at your own analytics i mean you know podcast.co do great analytics and so you know you you look at your analytics where's your audience coming from how long are they you know podcasters won't tell you this stuff because they're too embarrassed most of the time how long did anyone actually listen to your radio show uh, your podcast you know did they listen to the whole 90 minutes or 27 minutes or whatever it is Mm. Um, did they drop off halfway through but you've got to be honest with yourself about where your podcast adds value and um, then you've got to go back to sponsors who you think are going to be relevant to your audience and and vice versa and your audience is relevant to the sponsor Mm. and then fundamentally I, i believe just ask so many yep. people just don't ask, you know. That's a good point. What's the best strategy for, for asking and finding sponsors? Connect with them on LinkedIn, find about them, talk to them, explain what your podcast is and what the value would be for them. Don't try and just say, can I have a load of money? You yep. might start off with a barter deal. You know, I started when I first got sponsors asking for no money. I said to them, look, uh, I love your product. I've been mm-hmm. using it. I want to endorse it. I've got a great audience. I understand that you know, money's tight. So look, you give me a free use for a year of your product and I'll endorse you for a year. And then in the second year, we'll talk about the value that I've added and maybe then you'll start to pay me or six months down the road, whatever the time frame is. And I think you can always go in with a barter deal to begin with first. Try and find, you know, a non-monetary way of doing it. And then when you've proved that you actually generate value back to that sponsor, then you've got a strong card to say, well, look, now's the time to dip into your pocket and give me a little bit of cash. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting, good idea. Is and and also the fact that potentially you could even get the sponsor to help you with promoting your show. Once mm-hmm. they're sponsoring it, even if it's just a bar to deal, the, you know they're more, much more likely to say, "Oh, you know, listen to the latest episode." You know, and and if you can kind of get that from get that built into your podcast from the get go, that can only be a good thing, right? Yeah, and you know the the, the, the companies I work with, I I only work with companies I actually use products for, and, and mm. I will endorse naturally. Um, as I said, I wouldn't want to go and get Casper mattresses just because I wouldn't want to use them. Not because they're bad or good, by the way, just because I just don't know anything about them, right? And I'm just sitting there selling something for the sake of it. So I just don't think it works. Now, the, 
The other side of this is companies like Spotify and others are now beginning mm. uh, to inject ads into podcasts. And again, I'm not sure I, I think that's a good way forward for the industry. It seems with Spotify, I think they're trying to push the, the podcasting side of things because, you know, obviously they're not paying any royalties to those podcasters as they would pay royalties to um, recording artists, which, yeah, and it feels a little bit unfair that they're running ads, certainly because obviously a lot of, if you're not paying for Spotify, if you have a free account, you get ads served between songs or like you say, between podcasts or even in the middle of a podcast. But the actual producer of that podcast isn't seeing any of that revenue, which doesn't feel fair to me, not entirely no. anyway. Um, no, I, I think there needs to be a, be a better ad revenue share back to podcasts. But then again, the, the micro payments are going to become very difficult to make. I mean, how are you going to transfer? I think it's, you know, many sites go 25 or 30 pounds before you get it. And well, how, how are you going to know when you've got that? You know? What do you think about um, subscription model in terms of, you know, there's lots of, podcasts are on patreon for example they have some of them have like tens of thousands of subscribers some might have like a few hundred but even if you can get like a few hundred subscribers you've got enough really to run it as a business you know if you've got say i don't know 500 people paying five dollars a month so, so, so suddenly you've got two and a half grand a month coming in you know that's a that's a, a decent living you know to, to or at least kind of allow you to focus on it uh, more and more I think we've got a problem in the West where people aren't used to paying for content. Mm. Um, but I think the model's changing right now. I think you're beginning to see people say, okay, yes, I'll pay for the FT behind the paywall. I'll pay for Medium because I want those extra articles. I personally would pay for a, a Facebook, Twitter that was subscri a subscription model if it got rid of all the trolls and the hangers-on. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and... Yes, I think there, there is a model for paying for podcasts, but I just don't think it's in the West. If you look at the Far East, like Japan mm. uh, or China, you know, Himalaya is a podcasting host. And if you put your podcast up on there, the first thing it does is it's very front and center. How much yeah. would you like to charge for someone to listen to your podcast? Nothing is free. You set your own price and then people pay. And mm. I think the number one podcast on Himalaya has had 1.7 billion downloads. It's ridiculous. That's crazy, isn't it? And yeah. it's all paid for. And how about other type, other sort of monetization types? You know, have you ever sold anything? You know, courses or events or um, merchandise? Events is a great way. So. During COVID, me and two friends, we put on the podcast festival. Mm -hmm. We got some speakers and, and we charged for the event and that worked very well. Mm -hmm. I think that selling merchandise, again, I don't think I'm far enough down the road with where I want to be. So I'm on around six or 7,000 downloads per episode. I'd like to get to around 10,000 downloads an episode. And at that point, I feel I've got a strong audience that maybe I, then I can look at other monetization strategies. But sure. right now, I, I think I'd be spending money on content and, sorry, on 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 materials and product and, mm. and just have a warehouse full of Sam Talks technology mugs that no one wants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it's it, 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 the thing is i think with merchandise like my perspective on it is try and again make something that people want like think about what's think about little like catchphrases you know so it might be that you're putting quotes of someone you know from back and if you if you say play if you've got like a, a podcast talking about 60s classic rock or something you might put some quotes from famous recording artists or something like that on there you know just to make it kind of more interesting but i think mm. merchandise like i said you say certainly once you start building an audience if you create stuff that people want to wear or want to have on their desk you know and also be creative with it think about things like phone cases it doesn't just have to be a t-shirt or a mug it yeah. can be potentially good there's lots of services out there now which you know make it easy to print on demand as well so you don't have to carry stock i think this it's something that's um you know i've seen work pretty well for certain podcasts but again i think that maybe works better when you're talking about you know it's sort of almost like an entertainment style podcast so if it's like a something on you know type of music or if it's on if it's on kind of you know there's a lot of murder mystery type podcasts those sort of things you know um true crime that's the word i'm looking for yep you know that probably works maybe not for much for business and technology but who knows so one of the things i have done is taken on pr agent okay um and i think pr and blogging is going to get much stronger in the next couple of years mm. so when i was on the corporate side of life running a corporate business and um, we had a pr agency in those days i was always looking for outlets so you'd always go to the top magazines then it became the top bloggers and i think we will eventually see 
PR companies reaching out more and more to get their CEOs as guests on blogs, sorry, on podcasts, get their get get their snippet of content into a podcast so they're going to be hunting for podcasts i think which are aligned to their business because i think more and more people if you look at our attention span where do you spend your time you know do you spend your time listening to the radio listen to audio books podcasts or do you spend your time reading and i think more and more people are saying actually with a podcast i can be out of the gym on my bike in the car i can do all sorts of other things i'm not tied to my desk and that's where i think video doesn't play so well for me i think video means i have to focus on you much more yes, it, I agree. so i think podcasters should a try and find their own pr person if they think they've got to that level and b i think try and make their podcast aware to pr agencies it's, if they don't know you exist there's no way they're going to then try and put stuff your way and i think eventually you know pr agencies because those guests could eventually could become your future sponsors yeah, absolutely. And and like you say, you know, if you can kind of interview people who have got substantial followings because they, you know, high power CEOs or sports people or whatever it might be, you know, it's it's only a good thing because, you know, not only does it make really interesting content, but, you know, they have that audience, they have that sort of spread that they can push your podcast to once they've appeared on it. So I think getting the right guests on and also being a guest on other people's podcasts is great as well, I think. And I always ask my guests one favour. Yeah. So after I've interviewed them and we've turned off the mics, I always mm. ask them just one favour. Could they recommend one friend in their network who would be my next guest? Mm. And often they will pick a good person for you. And so it takes a lot of the pressure of, off you finding your next guests. Mm -hmm. And and if they've got, if they introduce you directly, even better. And exactly. Yeah, because it, it comes with that. It's almost like that recommendation, isn't it? Okay. Um, if anybody, if anyone has got any questions for Sam or myself, please put them in the comments. Um, and we'll, I think we're probably at question time now. I know you've got to get off for two. <laughs> uh, so um, let's kick off with uh, Russell Hope has asked. Um, most people listen to a podcast to auditory aligned. Um, if we're auditory aligned, are we accepting more of? Are we more accepting of nuances? Uh, I, I think what he's saying is I think he's disagreeing with me about taking ums and ahs, likes and your nose out and that's uh, just taste I think that's just taste uh, you know if I sit here and go uh, um, it's really annoying for me, I just don't like it and I just prefer because I can do it quickly and easily and it's not a, a chore just to take them out that's it um, okay and um, what are your thoughts on using audiograms which we should we kind of discuss already, but yeah, I think you have to do it. Um, so RSS, you what still has, but no one uses it. Has used to have pingbacks and trackbacks. I don't know if you remember those, mm -hmm. and it was a great way. So if you had a, a pingback, it was like I, I somebody's made a comment on their site and about your blog, and trackbacks were going the other way. Um, and I still would love somebody like Descript or, or Lately as an example. So I'd love to be able to comment within my transcript and then mm. take that comment and make that a tweetable item so that when my podcast goes out, there's a little button, you know, a, a comment button in the um, audio and somebody goes, oh, at, you know, James Mulvaney, I talked yeah. about you at 30 minutes, 22 seconds. Yeah. Guaranteed you're going to come and find out what I said about you. And I, I think... I agree. I agree. Yeah. It's like um, SoundCloud have a similar thing where you can comment at certain points of the track. Yeah. And I'd love it's, that to happen more generally. It needs to be, what there needs to be is a standard, really. It's like if you could have, if you could build that into the standard where, you know, the, the, you, you can kind of open it up to platforms because that's the thing. I think it's all very well just having like an enclosed environment like SoundCloud where you can comment on bits of the track, although SoundCloud is kind of more for, for music, isn't it? Um, and again, I, I'm not sure if SoundCloud has the traction now that it once had, but certainly like it, it was a really good way of actually being able to comment on a waveform, you know. Um, yeah, Vimeo has added in support for chapters and, you know, mm. and there's a few others doing it. And But again, not all platforms. Spotify doesn't recognize chapters. Apple does recognize chapters. Mm -hmm. um, nobody recognizes pingbacks and trackbacks that I'm aware of. Um, but audiograms, as I said earlier, it, it, you know, you've got to unlock the value, whether you do it manually or you do it automatically through 
products like lately. I think you've got to do that because no one's going to give you an hour and a half of their time just on the hope that it was an interesting podcast. Cool. Um, this is from Sal. How do you find a good PR agency? I'm always getting pitched at guests that don't fit the format. Good question. Uh, mm. I happen to know a couple of friends who are PR people. And what I do is I go out and I tell them what I want to deliver as my objectives. And then I ask them to send a brief back. If I get a waffly, we will help you randomly do something. Um, I want some tangible examples of where they've done stuff. And I want to set them clear objectives. So I don't pay for a retainer. I'm not one of these people who says, I'll give you a thousand or three thousand or whatever silly amount of money per month. And just on the hope that you might get me some noise. Mm. Um, I, I do it on a deliverable. So I want you to either get me on someone else's podcast. I want you to get me. So one of my objectives for me was to get onto radio lists. That's the one thing that I think podcasters can do really well at. Radio lists exist. Producers have people that they turn to, and I want to be one of those people that they turn to. So there's a story about Facebook breaking and Radio 5 Live wants to get somebody on the show to talk about it. I want to be that okay. person. I'm not, but I want to be. Now, yeah. that's one of my objectives. Tell me how many radio stations that are of relevance you're going to get me onto. Mm. Tell me how many other podcasts you're going to get me into. Tell me other, other ways that you think you can help me promote my brand. Is it worth trying to find um, sort of in that respect then trying to find a PR company that has got specific expertise in the radio industry or, um, you know, with, because the thing is, I think from my experience with a lot of PR companies is like, they'll have a go-to list of journalists that they will reach out to. And a, ca a case of a lot of the time is they work as in, you know, I've got a P I've got a press release as a business and they'll distribute that out and they'll sort of get me various articles on generally speaking, it's like trade news websites um, and to be honest, when, whenever I've tried them personally, they, they, the results have not been hugely impressive. But I think that sounds really exciting. What you've just mentioned is, you know, the idea is if you could be become the go to guy to, to give an opinion on a topic, yeah. either on radio or even TV. Um, there's, a, there's a guy here in Manchester called Dan Sodergren, and he has for some reason he is the guy he has been the go to guy for like BBC breakfast like whenever they need to get someone in to, to talk yeah. about technology he's like the one they come to and it's it's been fantastic for his personal brand you know well the radio shows that on that i go on to other radio shows and do, yeah it's because the producer just has me as their favorite person now to go to on a trusted mm. source they know that when i get on the mic i'm not going to be going oh yeah sorry don't know about that they know they're going to get something interesting it's quick and it's 30 seconds or whatever it may be mm. uh, and you just have to build it up but but what I'm trying to do with a PR agent is leverage their knowledge of the industry yes, and open their doors for me and then fundamentally become a trusted source. And then that builds my brand. And hopefully uh, some of their listeners might come and listen to my podcast. So that's how I try and grow my audience that way. Okay, great. Um, and I think we've got time for kind of like one final question. This is, this is good. Um, this is from Patrick. What do you think brings more awareness, live interviews like the one you're on now or podcasts? interesting um yeah i i think the live interviews that this comes back to radio versus podcasting right live versus on demand mm. and i think unfortunately i'm going to go with on demand not because i'm i'm against live i'm about to do a live ra uh, radio show in a minute but what i think is we are all time uh deficient and we we, we want to listen to what we want to listen to at a time mm. when we can <clears throat> this is brilliant this is you know i listen every week as a as a guest as you know um, and that fits in with me having a cup of tea, bits of lunch and whatever, and it works yes. perfectly. But if this was at two o'clock or three o'clock or four o'clock, I couldn't, right? Yeah. Um, so I would listen on demand. And I think the only thing I will say to anybody who's producing a podcast mm. is be consistent and persistent. If you deliver your podcast every Friday at three o'clock, make sure it's delivered at Friday at three o'clock. Don't miss that window. If your podcast is Monday, make sure it's Monday because – too often it's like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it on Tuesday. <laughs> well, that listener of yours, their habit is to listen to you at Monday at 2 o'clock while walking the dog. Yeah. If you're not there in their you know, podcast list ready to be listened to, they'll find another podcast, and guess what? They probably won't come back to you. So that, I would say, is persistent and consistent with your podcast. And live versus on demand, um, 
yeah, I, 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 I'm leaning more towards on demand just because people's habits are to listen when they want. Yeah, I mean, you know, the benefit, I mean, you know, just to add to that, I, I think if you can do both, it's great. It's just another way of engaging. I think one of the benefits of doing live is that you could take questions and you can be reactive to the audience and people feel like, you know, they're going to get to know you a bit better, perhaps. Um, but you can still do that on demand. But I think, of course, you know, if you, you know, if anyone's just tuned in now, perhaps they've just sort of tuned in towards the end of it. Of course, as soon as the second we finish, this is available to watch again on demand you know across a, a plethora of different of channels you know facebook youtube etc um so you know there, there's i think if you can try and do both it can be great and i think doing a live show can be a great complement to a podcast um yeah. you know uh, it's just but again it's it not live is not right for everyone like you mentioned earlier some people are intimidated by it there's no room for error and uh you know you've got to try and make sure that everything runs kind of on on time and according to, to sort of the, the plan which doesn't always happen when you're recording like you know exactly all right sam and 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 as as i've said just sort of making sure we've we've kind of recording everything on time we're out of time and i know you have to go off and do a radio show in 15 minutes so i don't want to keep you any longer so um for those of you uh, for people watching who want to find out more about you how can they get in touch um and how can they find out more about your event also so yeah please uh just come to samtalks.technology uh, you'll find all the ways of subscribing or finding how to get hold of me. I'm very open. If you're a great, if somebody wants to be a guest, let me know. We'll, we'll have a chat. Um, and the next event I'm doing is called Mashup. And that's, we've got Charlie Cabri talking about an amazing technology, which is interactive radio ads linked to your Alexa skill with frictionless commerce. Mm. So it's fascinating what he's built. And that's going out on the 22nd of October. So it's called Mashup.events. Come and have a look at it uh, and join us live, live on that one. Excellent. All right, that's Sam. Thanks very much for your time today.